So, uh, welcome to Dial Plan Scripting for non-programmers. Uh, Randy is uh, also, love this guy. Uh, as I said, Billy Chia, I work in the marketing department at Digium. So, you may have seen my videos. If you've seen a video and it has a Digium phone in it, I probably made that video. So, uh, I'm a DCAP trainer, so I've written some of the DCAP test and uh, some of our advanced training. You can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. So, I would uh, appreciate if you guys would, uh, again, if you guys happen to have cell phone service, if like you're on Verizon, shoot out a tweet and we will get the task. So my goal in the next 30 minutes is to give you three uh, basic examples. I want to show you how to do a test extension in the dial plan, how to do a dial subroutine, and of course some of you just got out of Claude's very informative AGI, so mine will, uh, you know, perhaps be slim, but hopefully we had some new people in and it's a different, uh, different audience. So with that in mind, basically, uh, I personally came to Asterisk from a sysadmin networking background. So I was an IT guy and, uh, you know, worked with networking mostly, but also telephony and uh, came to Asterisk and had, had never done any type of scripting. I was, a, I was an IT networking guy and I had never done any type of programming. So of course, in Asterisk, when you program the dial plan, it really is like programming. And so I imagine that many of you in this room perhaps have a similar background. You've come from system administration, networking, perhaps traditional telephony, and that's why I had in mind to give an introduction to dial plan programming. With that said, I'm basically assuming that you came to my talk yesterday and that we're starting from the ground up. So I'm assuming that you already have some background knowledge, you know what a context extension priority is, and that you know some basics of the dial plan. And uh, like I said, as I teach classes, and I meet people, I tend to find that this is what they ask about a lot. They say, I, I can do some stuff in the dial plan, but I just need that extra step. So I hope in the next 30 minutes to give you that extra step. With that being said, if you are already a developer and this is way below your level, please be kind on the uh, review form. And if you are brand new and you're like, man, this is super lame. He's basically saying I needed the talk yesterday to understand this talk. Uh, I apologize and please come see me in the hall and I would be uh, happy to, to break down the very, very basics. I would encourage you to still hang out that you're going to learn the types of things you can do in dial plan from the presentation even if it do, all the syntax doesn't make sense. So uh, with that said, if you're not a developer, maybe you don't know about programming languages. So just as a, I kind of treat this half hour like a, a CS 101, computer science 101. There are many different kinds of programming languages. Some are compiled, some are interpreted. You've got C, C++. Um, you know, if you're autistic, you can program in, in Lisp. And uh, these interpreted languages, it means it spins up an interpreter. You can, you can run them live. So actually, your Bash shell, when you log into Linux, is actually a Bash interpreter for the Bash shell scripting language. You can run uh, programming commands at the command line, and it'll spit back. Uh, you know, responses to you, you'll actually run that in the interpreted language. It doesn't need to be comp compiled. The dial plan, on the other hand, is what we would call a lightweight scripting language. It's uh, configured in extensions.conf. So there are many ways to configure dial plan. You can configure it in AEL. You can bump the configuration down to real time. You can uh, actually add uh, extensions from the CLI. But I'm going to be particularly talking about the syntax in extensions.conf. And it's parsed when the PBX config file is loaded. So it's not a compiled language. It's not really even interpreted language. It's, uh, it's lightweight scripting, and it's actually parsed. So uh, that means when the you know, PBX config is reloaded, and you guys will be familiar with the command dial plan reload. When you do dial plan reload, it goes out to the text-based file, and it reads in that configuration file. The particular purpose of the dial plan language is for call routing. So We'll talk about that as a function. So here are some components. Like I said, hopefully you're familiar with the context, extension, priority, and application. And what I would like to talk a little bit more about are variables, functions, expressions, and uh, subroutines. If I have a little time, I will also talk about uh, AGI. So we should kind of be familiar with this basic syntax. Up at the top here, this is a, an inside context. Contexts are denoted by square brackets. And that basically means create a bucket I'm going to put some scripts in, OK? And the scripts are extensions. So here we have extension 100. The syntax is 
extend equals greater than extend, uh, extension name, comma, priority, comma, application. And here are some applications, answer, playback, dial, voicemail, and we've passed some arguments to the application. So if you're not familiar with uh, programming, we would call this an argument that's being passed to the playback application. In this case, it's an audio file, hello world. If we had another audio file, like uh, you know, we recorded one and it said, uh, you know, AGI is great, then we could call it AGI is great, and you could pass that as an argument. It's, it's gonna behave differently depending on the arguments passed. So your best friends are going to be the CLI commands. So if you want to be a dial plan scripter, uh, you are, are going to need to do this. You're going to absolutely, as an imperative, on your Astra system, run core show applications. It will print out a list to you of all the applications available on your system. It won't print out to you all of the dial plan applications ever because it's going to be dependent on what modules you have loaded with an asterisk. That's OK. On your Astra system, if you're new to the game and you want to get up on board, do core show applications, and it's going to print out a full list for you. You're going to want to read that whole list just to familiarize yourself with the sorts of things available, right? What possibly can I do? Kind of like Claude just spoke about. He said, uh, you know, do AGI show commands. Same kind of concept. Go over that list. When you want to drill down into a particular application and learn about this, what does this application do? What's the syntax for this application? The syntax is core show application and then the name of the app. For example, core show application dial. So let me see if I can uh, screen cap for my uh, friend there and on my terminal. If I go to into asterisk, core, show, application, and let's just pick an easier one. I'll try playback. The idea here is you can see there's a wealth of information for you. The documentation is built into asterisk. It's really amazing. So it tells you a synopsis of what that does. This one's very simple. It plays a file, right? It gives you a description. It tells you what variables are set by that application. And most importantly, it gives you the syntax for that application. And I want to show you guys how to interpret this syntax. So the idea is you're going to always going to have the application name. You're going to have a parentheses in closing the arguments. And then it's going to tell you what the arguments are. Different applications expect different arguments. If it's something like this, file name, that means it's a mandatory argument. You have to pass a file name. Uh, or the application won't work. Some applications, for example, like answer, you can call answer with no arguments at all. They're all optional. Now these ones over here with the square bracket, that means it's optional. So the options you can pass after the comma, see the comma there? That means you don't have to, but you can. And likewise, you can play multiple sound files by concatenating. That means joining together multiple sound files with an ampersand. So I could do file name one, ampersand file name two, ampersand file name three, dot, 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 on and on and on. That's how to interpret that syntax. And it's the same relatively to read the syntax for all of the applications. So do core show applications, do core show application, application name. I would say just as an exercise on your VM or your box that you SSH into tonight, do this as a, uh, an exercise. And likewise for core show functions, and then core show function name, and I'll teach you a little trick if I can find the right screen here. Uh, when you do core show function, and let's say we're doing timeout, right? If I say core show function timeout, it says, ah, I, don't ha I have no idea what that is. This is because all functions in asterisk are caps. So if I tab complete, right? So if I start typing timeout and I tab complete, that's you hit the tab key, it'll complete the rest of the phrase. It'll pop it into all caps for you. And that way, you can likewise see how that function works, OK? Moving right along, let's look at our test extension. So why would you want a test extension? The idea is, if you're going to do a lot of dial plan scripting, you're going to want to be able to, to test rapidly to prototype. So you really don't want to be sitting there and put in, a, put in a script or testing out some dial plan logic. And then every single time, you have to call from your phone. So I, I dial the extension from my phone. I dial from the extension from my phone. What you really want to be able to do is to be able to hit your script from the CLI. 
Now, we want some things to do. We don't just want to hit any script from the CLI. We basically want to be able to bridge two channels together, a test channel together with whatever it is that we're testing. And uh, we want that test channel possibly to do some things. So at a minimum, I could possibly just say, well, answer this channel and wait around for a certain period of time and then just hang up. If all I need is an open channel for my other logic to execute, that'll be just fine. In my case, I've created this dial plan logic because I want audio, I want media to play on the channel. So this would be if I was testing some call recording logic or if I'm testing over a phone and I want to answer it and I want to hear that media. So let's unpack this step by step. First, at step one, I have called this extension test. The name of the extension is literally test. Keep in mind that not all dial plan applications, they don't need to be named after numbers. Because this one I never dial into it, I always call it from the CLI, it's much more convenient to have a name. Priority one answers the channel. Then at priority two, I'm going to set a variable. This should all be review from yesterday or familiar. Set the variable count to zero. This is called initializing the variable. If I forget this step and I just try to call a variable, I can get very strange behavior or it just won't work at all. So this is uh, important to always initialize the variable. Then here I'm going to play back an audio file called TT Monty Nights. Then I increment the count. Here I'm using a, uh, an expression, which is dollar sign square brackets. And I'm saying set the count variable to its previous value plus one. Then I'm routing conditionally. Is that value less than three? If not, if, uh, if that's true, if it is less than three, then go to default test play, which is the default context, the test extension, and the play priority. I use the priority label there. And if not, uh, you can see I've omitted the false destination. It's just going to fall through to the next priority. So the way I do this on the CLI, maybe, is it looks like this. We're going to do channel originate, OK? So the syntax for channel originate is from the Astro CLI. You do channel originate. And I'm going to use the local channel. The local channel is not like a SIP channel or you know, a DOTI channel. It's like an internal channel that allows me to treat a dial plan extension as though it was a SIP channel. And I can bridge it to uh, a specifically to an application. In this case, I want to bridge it to an extension. And so I bridge it to whatever extension at context I want to test. So if I go to my CLI and I do channel originate, Te uh, local, because it's a local channel, so this is like technology slash resource. The same way you would dial SIP slash phone one or DOTI slash channel one, here I'm dialing local slash test. And normally I'd be test at default, but if it's the default context, you can leave it off, which is why I like default for testing. But as a, as a security notice, never, ever, ever put your logic in the default context. So just for security purposes, uh, don't use a default context, create a default context, hang up on every call that goes there. That's just for security. So I'm going to bridge to an extension. I will bridge to the test extension. And now I can see, I didn't have to make a phone call off a phone. I can see with my test extension, I did channel originate, and I can see my dial plan logic executing. This is called uh, debugging. Essentially, what I want to do is I want to run my script, and then I want to ask myself, did it actually run? So I can see here that it did. It's giving me a wealth of information. It's telling me I executed test at default, at priority one. And there's two different channels. Here's the name of the channel. So this, you can see they almost have the exact same name, except this one is, is one and this one is two. So it's actually two channels bridged together. First it answers. Then you can see it sets my variable. It's playing back. And here I can see that my, uh, my audio file is played. And that's just going to keep going through that loop. So I can do a uh, channel request, possibly request, hang up all, and hang up on those channels. So like I said, the CLI is your friend. And this is basically how to code, right? How do I code? Well, write some code. Run the code. Fix the bugs. <laughs> step by step is how to, how to write some code. The idea would be. The CLI is where you want to change your code. When I meet novice scripters, when I meet people from an IT background that don't have a, a computer science degree, 
and they start learning dial plan scripting, and they find an error in the dial plan, immediately they open up extensions.conf and they start reading through trying to find their syntax error. You're not going to find it. And I'm just, as a, as a loving friend, I'm just telling you, close the text file, open up the asterisk CLI. On the asterisk CLI, it's so rich because it tells you exactly how asterisk sees that file, and uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate here. So, let's say I have extensions.conf, and here is my test extension hidden amongst all my stuff I did yesterday, okay? And let's just say, let's just say as an example, I forgot, I, I just had a typo, and I forgot to type in that parenthesis, right? If I'm on the asterisk CLI, right? And now let's say I execute my command, right? I'm, I've written a script, I want to test out the script. I can test it like this, and look at what happens. I get a warning here, and it's telling me, hey, there's no such application as count equals zero, such and such, and it's telling me exactly where the problem is. It says that the de default context and the test extension at priority two, Billy, you have screwed something up again. So I can open up extensions.conf, and I can see, oh, here's my test extension and my, my default context. At priority two, oh, and in fact, if you're using Vim or some other uh, nice text editor that does syntax highlighting, I can even see I, I messed that up. So that's kind of the process of debugging. When you run the script, you want to run it on the CLI. You want to be very familiar with the verbose output to see it step by step. Now when I do dial plan reload, now when I originate my test, hey, it runs beautifully, and I can uh, hang up on the channels. So let's actually jump into a subroutine. So, uh, you know, what's a, what's a subroutine? Well, I, I, I like to use the analogy of uh, programming kind of like baking a cake. And I ripped this off from the guy from MIT. He does some computer uh, classes online and came up with this analogy. I think it's, it's very apt. The, the idea is when you're, when you're baking a recipe, what do you do? Well, you go into your recipe box, and your recipe box has a whole bunch of recipes. So you pull out a recipe and you say, I want to follow this recipe and you're going to follow it step by step. Well, that's just like programming. Think of your context, your dial plan context, as a bucket, like your recipe box. It's got a whole bunch of scripts in there. Every extension is its own recipe that's going to be followed step by step in order, right? Now, uh, sometimes what you want is you want to uh, have something that's where you're doing something until a condition is met, right? So imagine uh, beat these eggs until they're stiff, right? That's like a loop. That's like a loop in programming. So what you want is you want to create some kind of condition, and then when that condition is met, you stop looping. That's kind of what we saw in the test extension, that it's going to loop through until I finish my uh, condition. In, this, in, in the test case of my test extension, it was when I've repeated it three times, right? Now, what happens when I've got a recipe, and this is a really good recipe. Now, this is where the analogy breaks down. It's a really good recipe. And I want to use it over and over and over again. So maybe the same recipe works good for lemon cake and cherry cake and you know cream pie cake. And uh, what if I want to use it over and over again? Do I have to rewrite it every single time? And the answer is no. The beauty, the beautiful thing about programming, about scripting, is you can, you can do it once and then access that code over and over and over again. It's very efficient. And so, the concept of a subroutine is that's all it is. It's basically saying I have a little piece of code and I want to get it a lot. I want to use it over and over again. In this case, let's imagine I have many phones. I have 100 phones. I have 1,000 phones. And I want to write a dial uh, script to dial the phones. Now, I want to have features for my users. In some cases, I want Find Me, Follow Me. So some users, I want to ring their cell phone first via Find Me, Follow Me, or however the user wants their profile set up. And then some users, they just want to ring the desk phone. They don't want Find Me, Follow Me, or maybe they want both. And then for some users, they want voicemail, and maybe some users don't want voicemail. Now, what I could do for all my 100 phones is I could program that same, that series of routines over and over again and just type the same code. But psh, that's not efficient. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is a dial plan subroutine that allows me to write the code once and access it over and over again. So, this is what the dial plan subroutine looks like. 
it's a little bit small on the slide, so I will expose it on the CLI, which is probably, you guys can see that a little bit better. Okay? The idea here, and let me make sure I have my right things commented, okay? So at the start, I'm using go sub as my dial plan subroutine. Now, how many people are familiar with macro? Have you used macro? Okay. How many people have used go sub? Okay. So the beauty of go sub, in fact, macro in the modern versions of asterisk is deprecated. So uh, macro had a bunch of problems, and it's now gone away. So if you're on a modern version of asterisk, you really want to use go sub anyway. It's been around for quite a while. I think at least since 1.6 uh, in the series there. I'm pretty sure you can use it on 1.6.2. It doesn't nest very well, so if you want to if you want to go deep, it's also resource intensive because when you enter into the macro, it. So the question was, what's the problem with macro? Uh, when you enter into the macro, you're in that macro application. The macro application is literally running, so you're tying up resources. So if you have a lot of calls at once, it's not very efficient. You're in a macro application uh, running, and um, then it also doesn't nest well. So sometimes you know seven levels deep. Your, your macro fails, or maybe even less than that, depending on how complex your logic is. With GoSub, the beauty of it is that you can nest almost infinitely. So GoSub, rather than ex being in an in a application that you ex that's executing, it's very similar to GoTo. In fact, I like to think of GoSub the same thing as GoTo, but with, with two like bonuses. It's kind of like GoTo with a little bonus. One of those bonuses is it's going to save an address to the stack. Okay? So if you imagine, uh, let's look at this go sub here in my internal underscore phones context. So here I have a go sub, right? And this go sub is just like go to, and it's going to go to a dial plan address. So this can be a context extension priority. It can be extension priority within the current context. It can simply be a priority within the current extension, which is awesome. You could not do that with macro. Macro had to go to its own context. With a go sub, you can even do subroutines within a singular extension. So in this case, I'm going to go to another extension. I'm going to go to the main dial extension, priority one. And then the other difference, along with saving an address to the stack, I'll talk about that more in a second, is that you're going to get uh, arguments. You can pass arguments to the uh, go sub application the same way you could with macro. And uh, very similar to macro, or very similar to AGI, these arguments become variables that you can then access in your subroutine. So let's look at this. I go here from the main dial. So if I were to uh, execute extension 600, it's going to go to main dial extension 1. And you've noticed here I've passed some arguments. And this uh, is like the SIP account or the uh, find me, follow me account name. This is going to be accessible as arg1. The extension number is going to be accessible as arg2. Arg3, I've just left as an empty blank because I don't want to enable that feature. So Arg3, 4, and 5, I've set up as a toggle flags. This is kind of how the subroutine works. If they want find me, follow me, I put in FF for find me, follow me. If they don't, I leave it blank. And then I'm going to route conditionally based on that flag. Here's what it looks like. You go from the go sub into the main dial. I verbose, a little verbose logging, I say, I'm going to dial Arg1 at Arg2. So I'm dialing Adorner at extension 600. That's what's going to show up on my CLI. Then I just do a little go sub ifs. So now I'm going another layer down into the subroutine. Here I'm comparing, does arg3 equal ff? If it does, go to the follow me sub, the subroutine for find me, follow me. If it doesn't, well, just fall through to the next priority. So you see this, this scales very nicely because you could have like 20 or 30 steps there, whatever kind of features you want, and it's just going to fall through to the next priority. If the user wants that feature, you can enable it, and you can toggle it as a variable, right? So here, it's going to go to the follow me sub. The follow me sub is very simple. It's just uh, follow me, priority one, and it goes to the follow me application. Uh, I'll mention something, if you're not familiar with programming, what they call variable scope, OK? Now, variable scope in a traditional programming language is only amazing means when you go into a subroutine, that variable is only accessible within that subroutine. For example, I set arg1, the variable arg1, to a Dorner, and then I went to the main dial. So here I am, within this subroutine, arg1 is going to be equal to Alan Dorner. But if I go another layer deep, here I go now to another subroutine. I'm going a layer deep, and I lose that variable. The variable, I've now gone out of the scope of that variable. 
So I need to pass it again to the next layer down. This is why here I pass arg1 from the previous layer up, I'm passing it to that layer down. So here in the follow me sub, I can access adorner, which is I've set up in followme.conf, the adorner account name, and I've passed A. So this is an idea when Alan gets a call on his cell phone, he can press one to accept or two not to accept, right? Same thing with a desk. I've done it a little bit different here. This is just to show you guys a little bit of uh, wizardry or there's a different way to do it. The idea is when I want to call the desk phone, I could pass arg1 as a variable like I did in the follow me subroutine. I mean, here's another way to do it. I made arg1 part of the actual extension name. So in the desk subroutine, the desk phone subroutine, I set a pattern match. You can tell because I have an underscore. And then it starts with desk dash, and then the dot means anything else at all. So if I call it from you know, a Dorner, it would be de desk dash a Dorner would match that pattern match. If I call it from R Fergus, desk dash R Fergus would match that pattern match. So what happens at the pattern match? Well, it's going to dial, and it's going to dial the SIP account. And I'm using the cut function to take the extension, which was desk dash a Dorner. I'm going to cut it based on the dash. So that kind of means like split it based on the dashes. So on one half, it'll say desk. On the other half, it'll say R, R Fergus, because it cut that extension name in half. And then I say, give me the second half. So just give me the R Fergus. So this is how I'm dialing SIP slash R Fergus. I do for, so for 20 seconds. Now, as we should be familiar from yesterday, when we exit the dial plan application, it's going to set the dial status variable. Typically, no answer if I don't answer, busy if I, if I hit ignore. And I want to pass that variable back up to the previous subroutine. So you see, I'm going down levels. I want to pass it back up to the previous level. Now, technically, this is um, redundant because dial status is set on the channel, which has the top scope within the channel. Uh, it's not, not the top scope within the dial plan, but the top scope within the channel. But I wouldn't rely on that. I would rather like to scope my variables. So in the return application, what the return application does is it says, hey, go back up to the next stack and continue executing. So when I call follow me sub, it goes to follow me sub, and then it returns back here to go to the next priority. When I call the desk sub, go to the desk phone sub, and then return to keep executing in that previous subroutine, right? The idea is I've passed dial status as a return value and I can access the dial status in the go sub ret val, which is kind of uh, bumped a little off the screen here. But in the go sub ret val, that's going to hold the value. So if I call the phone and the phone is busy, I'm going to pass busy to the return application. The return application is going to bump up to the previous dial plan uh, subroutine. And then within that next subroutine, I can access it from the variable go sub ret val, which I've done when I go to the voicemail sub. In the voicemail sub, I uh, pass args1, arg2, which are from the previous subroutine, and the go sub ret val. So now that dial status is going to be accessible as arg3. Let's look at the voicemail sub. The voicemail sub says go to arg2, which if you remember, see I've passed it down two levels. Here it was extension 600. Now in this it's arg2, and I pass arg2 in. And so I can still access it here as arg2. Then I'm using the if function. If function, very simply, is going to return one value or another. Uh, so I want to return either b or u. So based on arg3, if arg3, which if remember is the go sub ret val, which came from the dial status, which exited the dial status. You guys are following me, right? Uh, <laughs> if arg3 is busy, and I just realized I was uh, messing around with this during the 1, 2, 3. If arg3 is busy, then I want to. I want to return B, so I play the busy message. If not, I'd like to return U, and then I can return here, and at which point I hang up, or if I had more dial plan logic. So if that was kind of a quick for you, um, you know, I'll try to make my slide notes available, or you guys will be able to check the, check the video, and um, you, know, you can kind of examine it in more detail. But off of this basic construct, it's, it's allowing you, see, you can see as I dial each phone, it only has one line of code. So if I want to add 100 more phones, instead of having to add 300 more lines of code or 700 more lines of code, depending on how long my, my thing was, I just have to add one line for each phone. I can access a subroutine because I've used variables and the expressions and functions. I've made it scalable. So let's take a look 
at how it, it works. So in theory, what I'm treating this is this would be like Ryan Fergus's phone when I dial 601, right? So when I call 601 from the CLI, he should have find me, follow me enabled. We're going to treat this phone as though it's like his uh, cell phone. So he should hear a prompt, you know, that sort of thing. And then if I reject it, then it should go to his desk phone and then voicemail. So live demo, let's find out if it actually works. I will use my local test extension. And I'm going to originate to 601 at internal underscore phones, which is where I had that context. So here it is. My Go sub begins to execute. And let's follow along with the debug uh, you know, routine. So I can see my test extension is playing. And now the follow me application is prompting the caller to say, hey, record your name, and we're going to play the name. So here my, uh, my phone is ringing. Let's answer it. I do not want to accept that call. So I will hit two. Hey, it's uh, going through to my other phone. So let's answer. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> that's a TT Monty Knights, right? So that's kind of the, the subroutine in action. Is it, it did the find me, follow me. It went through the other phone. And uh, you know, of course, I could have tested voicemail. Um, I had a warning there, but it's, it's not relevant to the subroutine. So let's see. How long do I have till? Till 3.05? OK. Um, so the last thing I want to show you guys very quickly is the concept of uh, why you should do an AGI. If you're in the last session, you're like, hey, I'm, I'm down. But for those who are new to programming, the idea here is when you go to a programming 101 class, uh, very common, like the first script they make you write is to, is to calculate Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci was this uh, you know, Italian mathematician. And the idea here is you've got, you take two numbers, 0 and 1. You add them together. You get 1, right? So then you add 1 and 1, and you get 2. Add 1 and 2, you get 3. Add 2 and 3, you get 5. You guys see the pattern here. You keep on adding the two numbers. And it goes on and on and on. And they make you calculate this in a programming class. They'll say, give me the, I want to give you a term, like let's say the 10th term. And, and I want you to return the nth Fibonacci. So if I say 10, I want you to return to me 55, right? So uh, again, I'm going to show a dial plan example and an AGI example. Here is just my, uh, I'm using the read application. These are going to call my subroutines to, uh, you know, basically you would dial in what number do you want. It's going to write it to a variable called n. I'm going to do a go sub with, uh, in the Fibonacci context. Again, I'm using this trick where I've named the extension using a variable. So if I go to extension fib1, it'll give me the first term. If I go to fib10, it'll give me the 10th term, on and so forth. And then I'm returning the value with a go sub ret val, and uh, I can use it to say the digits. This is exactly the same. The difference between the, the two is that this extension is called fib AGI because it calls AGI. So, here is what my Fibonacci sequence looks like. I'm not going to step through this step by step, but it's basically just uh, it takes the two numbers and it adds them together, and then it shifts the values and it keeps on calculating them. And uh, the only thing I'll comment on is I'm using the argc here to find out if the uh, extension was executed from the subroutine. So I want to be able to both execute it from the subroutine when I dial by the phone and execute it directly when I test. So this part right here is not part of the actual subroutine. It's just saying, hey, if there's an argc, then use the return. If there's not argc, then just hang up, depending on how I call the subroutine. This, you can see, is significant fewer lines of code. In this case, I'm uh, setting the extension, and I'm using uh, the AGI to execute the AGI in Python. And let me show you the Python code. This is not all the Python code. But this is the Python code that calculates the Fibonacci number. So you can see, if you learn Python, see how much easier this is to program something simple like calculating Fibonacci numbers than it is to do this, right? So this is the dial plan version. This is the normal full-featured programming language version. So the, the idea here is dial plan is good for call routing, but it's not good for everything. When you want to do calculation, uh, when, you, when, you, when you want to do complex programming, when you want to uh, 
you know, perhaps query multiple databases, it really behooves you to actually learn, um, to learn a real programming language, <laughs> you know, rather than just a scripting language. In my case, I've, uh, I've chosen Python here. So I can uh, go to the CLI here, and uh, I think that I can demo it very quickly, how, what it looks like. If I dial 101, Please enter the number you wish to call. what term should I do? Seven. One, three. So 13 is the seventh Fibonacci term. And you guys can see how it went, and that one executed my, my AGI Fibonacci. So the idea is if I do uh, 100, this is, now, now just look at this real quick. This is the uh, amount of, uh, you know, just very little maybe that a screen's worth of, uh, you know, verbose output. If I dial 100. Please enter the number you wish to call. One, three. So that worked as well, but look at how much output it went through. You know, so I really don't want to see all that on the, on, on the dial plan. There are some guys who like to do all the programming in the dial plan, but I would say dial plan is good for call routing. Uh, if you want to go a little bit beyond that, learn a little bit of programming language, I will recommend to you some resources. So in particular, there are many resources online. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, I've already mentioned, is phenomenal. Uh, Code Academy, Coursera, and in particular, I highly recommend if you are an IT guy, if you're a networking guy, if you're a telco guy, and you're like, I just want to learn a little bit of development. I, and that's, this is what I am. I'm not a developer. I'm like, I tell people I'm a coder, not a developer. Then uh, check out the Udacity courses. The Udacity uh, are very, very nice. And you can learn a little bit of programming and do some powerful things with it. As a last resource, I would recommend the Asterisk Cookbook. Uh, it's available online. Uh, Life and those guys wrote it. It's, it has some really nice recipes in there for dial plan scripting. And um, just want to say uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Billy. And once again, uh, we have an expert in our presence. So anybody have any questions? I'm not going to make you go up to the stand. We have a question right here. Mm -hmm. Can you show an example of that? Of passing variables to originate? Yeah. So, you, you know, you're calling your local to do a test. Uh -huh. But inside of your, um, inside your dial plan, you're looking for variables that are being passed in. Okay. So the question is, uh, when I'm looking for variables with my originate command. So let's take a look at that real quickly. Add extensions.conf. And let's go to my test extension, which... I can find, of course I call, I have too many, too many things called test in here. While you're, yeah, while you're looking, Billy, um, you neglected to mention that Google is your friend. Yes. And almost every programmer in every language, and that includes extensions. The first time I learned how to use extensions, I've just found somebody's extensions file online. Okay. Do a search and you'll find it. Uh, so you certainly, yeah, search for extensions.com. Uh, what I have personally found is, is a lot of times people, the reason they've posted their extensions.conf is because it's broken and they want some <laughs> troubleshooting. That's true. Um, but uh, yeah, as Google is your friend and pound asterisk. Uh, those, those guys are, are wicked awesome. And uh, you know, when you get in there, just go to pastebin, pastebin.com, paste your dial plan in there, paste your logs in there, be polite to those guys because they want to help you out, but they're doing it out of their goodwill. And then you go into the IRC chat room and you say, hey, Here's the link. Can somebody help me and ask your question specifically? And uh, that is also a great resource to you. So I want to point out here that I'm using some variables in this test subroutine. So for example, I'm setting count. Oh, of course. Well, you guys would like to see that, wouldn't you? Uh, so in this case, I'm using, if you guys can see that at this line here, I'm, uh, you know, I answer the channel, I set count, and count equal to one, okay? Um, there's a couple ways to, to find out what your variables are called. Um, first of all, they just show up, but additionally, I'm gonna show my, uh, a couple. I'm gonna show no op, and the value of count is count, okay? So that's gonna tell me what's in there. I'm gonna also do uh, chan dump. Is it dump chan? 
dump Chan. We'll, we'll find out. Let's try this just in case. I don't know if that'll even execute. Hedging your bets. Let's, let's find out. Okay, so we're doing local uh, test to extension test. Okay, um, so let's look at the uh, let's look at the execution here and see if I can. Uh, so it's it's obviously it's playing through the file now, but but take note that um, uh, the file's a little too long to play. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here we go. We can see it's saying set, and if you remember the logic, the logic was set count to its previous value plus one. So here on the CLI, even just without any debugging, it's telling me I set count equal to one. So in the, in the dial plan, this was, a, this was a, a variable, or it was actually a variable inside of an expression. And here on the CLI, it's evaluated. But additionally, here's my no op. The value of count is one. So I can see the value of that. And it got to a dump chan, and it dumps the channel data. So this is really nice because it's showing you all the variables on that channel. And it looks like uh, chan dump was the one. No application chan dump. So dump chan is what we want. Chan dump, don't do that one. In any case, this is nice. It's going to give you the, the, the name of the channel. Um, about all of this data is on the channel. And then if you have variables set, it shows you your variables. So here, count is equal to 1. And playback status is equal to success. Those are variables on the channel. We have uh, any other questions? Uh, right over here. When you call a subroutine with arguments, is it passing it by value or by reference? It is. OK, so the question is, are we passing it by value or by reference? And the answer is, that I think, that it's going to actually pass it by reference. So if you, if you noticed, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, here in my subroutine. So for example, you notice that I actually pass it here. I pass a variable as an argument. So that's not passing the, uh, the literal string dollar sign exd colon. It's actually passing in uh, you know, the value of that variable because I've, I've dereferenced it. It's, uh, it's, it's going to pass in 600. So 600 is going to be available in in arg, uh, in arg two. Well, I guess what, what I'm getting at is, can you modify the value in the subroutine, and will that value automatically be understood by the calling extension? All right, that's. If I want to modify the value from within the subroutine. Right, uh, of, the, of the argument that you passed. OK, so, so for example, if I had something here, and I wanted to say set. And I want to say, you know, uh, something like this, like arg1. Actually, that's not. OK, well, let's, let's just do it this way. Test equals to uh, arg1. And then maybe something like, you know, 456 or 567 or whatever. Uh, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not quite sure what, what you'd want to accomplish. But here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pass in. Instead of arg1, it's, it's going to be a donor. So I'm now creating the string. A donor five six seven. If I did do it this way, I'm I'm now like overwriting that variable where I'm I'm creating a channel variable called arg one, and I'm overwriting the value of arg one with arg one five six seven, or with 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 a donor five okay. six seven. And that's that's probably going to be a little bit wonky. I, I will I will tell you guys. Um, it's uh, I said, it's, I said it's scoped, but it's not actually totally, that's not actually totally the case. It's actually masked. And uh, so I was trying to keep it simple. But the, uh, the idea is, is um, so for example, if you do a chan dump, you'll actually see the levels of your subroutine that you actually have multiple arg1s depending on what level you're in. And that if you want to really scope it down, you can use the local function. And so if you want to keep a, uh, you want to keep a, a variable local just to that subroutine and you don't want it to be messed with, you can, you can scope it down with a local function, and then when you exit the subroutine, the, the variable goes away. We have uh, any other questions, or is it time for the next talk? 
What, uh, what, time, what time do I go till? I think, I think the question that was being begged a second ago is really, are there global veg uh, vegetables, global variables? Isn't oh, that what you said? Oh, OK, OK, OK. Isn't that what you asked? Yeah. So is um, there a global scope? The, OK, so is there a global scope? I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's, two, there's, there's several ways to use uh, global variables. So for example, in your, in your dial plan here, OK, dial, see, dial plans, it's, it's not quite like, you know, you can't compare it to Python in terms of scope, because scope is, it is related to the subroutine, but it's also related to the channel, right? So if I want a, a variable that's global in scope across all of my subroutines, I can set a channel variable, and it's, a, it's accessible to all of my subroutines. So kind of like I said, dial status is a channel variable. It's on that channel. As long as that channel is up, it's accessible in any subroutine. So in that sense, it's kind of global in scope. However, there are something in dial plan called global variables. You can set them in a couple ways. So in the global section, I can just set you know, var equals value. And now I've got a variable called var, and it's set with the value value. And it's, it's, it's global in, in the sense that it's accessible on all of my channels. Uh, regardless of what channel I'm on, I can access that, that variable var. And you can also do it with the um, global function. So, I'll just uh, you know, go down here and say, I want to do something like this. What do we figure out that this one was bad? And I want to say set and uh, set and then use the global function and you know, var something like that. I'm actually, I don't want to dereference it. I want to set it equals new val. So here what I've done is now I've, I've oh, I, I, in my, when I load my dial plan, the globals in the global section are going to be available on all of my channels, really, truly global in scope on all my channels and all my subroutines. In this particular test script that I've written, when I get down to this priority, I'm now overwriting the value of that global var using the global function, and I'm putting a new value in there. So, there's multiple ways that you can, you can set global variables. Actually, I, I don't know if you mentioned this. I had to go out for a second. But there's also a database function, correct, for persistent variables. Did you get it, into that at all? It's kind I, of complicated. I didn't talk about that. That's, a, that's an excellent point. So you can use the DB function. And um, you know the idea is, uh, how would I do this? I would say like set, and then I could say DB, and then I would have like family key. Um, I forget the syntax I need to do seal I show equals you know some stuff here <laughs> it's similar to that we can do a core show function DB if you do core show does that look good to you yeah and well I don't know about the syntax but the point being this is something that comes up a lot you okay. want to maybe uh, save a state of something and when you reboot the state is still there you can reboot yes. the entire machine so with this system the ask yeah the ask DB is gonna be persistent across reboots so if you need a if you need a variable in persistent state uh, you can save it into a key in the askdb using the db function. And yeah, I don't know about syntax, but the idea is use, you can use the db function and set it in there, and then you can dereference it using the db function, and you can call for that, whatever's in that, uh, in the askdb. And the askdb used to be just like a simple uh, Berkeley DB, and I think they've, they've updated to, um, uh, yeah, SQLite. So. Very powerful. No, um, that is, I don't, I, I can see how you would call that a global variable. So that, if, in my understanding, really when you're talking about, uh, is you're talking about variable inheritance. So the idea would be I have one channel and I'm bridging it with another channel and I want that variable available on the other channel. So an example would be I'm calling from one phone and, oh gosh, okay, let's say, uh, let's say I'm just, I, I want to set like, a, set like a call recording toggle or something like that, right? And I'm, I, when I call on one channel, I set that variable, but it's only set on that channel. When I bridge it to another channel, it's not set on that channel. If I declare the variable with a single underscore, it'll be inherited by channels created by the original channel. So you get kind of like sing, what they call single inheritance. If you use a double underscore, it's, um, it's able, and that's like just to be able to inherit it like one level. If you create double underscore, 
it's able to be inherited by multiple channels. I don't know if I'm totally explaining that right. I guess we would call that, in a sense, that makes it like a global variable because you have double underscores. Of that variable you've set on one channel is now available on other channels. But it's really, uh, and actually I don't even know in the code if it's, if it's the same mechanism. To me it seems like two different mechanisms, but you could probably get there the same way where you're setting global variable, it's available on all your channels, double underscore, it's being inherited from a channel. So you can also, I'm sorry. yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff with, with variables and variable inheritance, but. Okay, we're getting down to the wire here because if anybody wants to take a break, you have about 14 minutes to do so. Okay. Hey, Billy, thank you, guys, thank you. Thank you guys very Let's much. Let's hear it for Billy. <laughs> Such a great teacher, we don't want to let him go. <laughs>